director of the Jean Golding Institute, which is the University of Bristol Institute for, da for Data Science and Data Intensive Research. Um, and it's a huge pleasure to welcome you all this morning for this um, presentation we have by Dr. Rob Channon on COVID-19. I've just got a few housekeeping bits and pieces to, to go through with you and then we'll get started. So Rob, if you could give me the next slide. Thank you, Rob's in control this morning. Um, so first of all, to let you know that the session is being recorded, it would be great if you could take a look through our JGI, our Gene Golding Institute Code of Conduct for online events. And if you haven't had a chance to do that yet, you'll find the link in the chat. If you could mute your microphone, um, unless you're invited to ask a question by the, by the speaker or the chair, the chairs, which the chairs today are, are me and Natalie Thelby, and that would be great. It just helps with um, kind of keep, keep, keeping a lid on background noise. Um, we'd really like to, to know more about you. So please complete the registration and the feedback form. It's really important to us to know what you've enjoyed from these sessions um, and also to hear your suggestions about what we could do in the future, what kind of events would appeal to you. Um, and we, it's a shame we're not doing this face to face, of course, but let's try and make the best of the networking opportunities we do have. So if you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat box, your name, your role, where you're from, um, that would be really great. Thanks, Rob. Next slide. And we're going to use Slido today for questions. It helps us collate them in the background. Um, and also you can vote for questions that you like. Um, so this is the link and there's the code 295256, which you'll also find in the chat. Next slide, please. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Great. Um, so many of you may also may already be friends of the Gene Golding Institute, but for those who are not, we're one of five university uh, Bristol research institutes. Um, the research institutes are constituted outside of the faculty structure, which gives us a lot of independence. Um, but our, we all share a main remit of developing and supporting multidisciplinary multi research communities around our topic areas, which, as you know, for us is data science, data intensive research. So we have four main strategies, kind of strategic areas, priority areas, which you can see on this infographic. And they are um, societal challenges, data visualization, which is quite broad. It includes materialization and realization, data communication, um, reproducibility um, and uh, data governance. And that includes kind of open, open data agenda, as well as conversations around um, consent and ethics, for example. And fundamental or foundational research, which at Bristol is largely in science and engineering. So, for example, working with mathematicians, statisticians and computer scientists. And we deliver these um, strategic priorities through the four horizontal mechanisms that you can see here, which are um, developing communities. So, for example, this kind of networking. We also provide a home for hackathons and data study groups. Um, we have CCORN funding for collaborative multidisciplinary projects um, throughout the year. We put on training, um, professional development courses. So you'll, you'll know from uh, Bristol Data Week that we have a number of training courses this week. But in fact, we also work with work, work very closely with other partners in the university and beyond to offer those kinds of training courses uh, through the year and also some bespoke events for particular communities as well. We are the portal for the University of Bristol's relationship with the Alan Turing Institute, which is the National Institute for Data Science um, and AI. And we run a data science surgery service, Ask JGI, where researchers in the fields can email us or talk to us on Slack with their queries and we will work with them to try and point you in the right direction. Next slide, please. So you're all here, you've all registered. So you've probably seen a version of this schedule before, but this is data week. We're now on Thursday, so we're day four. And you can see that we've tried to, um, to work with people to put on, put, put on events that represent all aspects of the data science pipeline, if you like. So, so everything from generating data, managing it through to data communication and, and analytics. And very roughly, as you can see on this slide, we have training events, which are color coded in blue, workshops, uh, networking events in green, and talks in yellow. Um, and you can see that we've also got a couple of lunchtime networking events, which are the pink events, which we're running on the platform Remo. Please do come along to the next one, uh, which is on Friday. It's a great opportunity to do some networking and meet some of us in a kind of virtual lounge format. Next slide, please. 
there are lots of ways um, that you can engage in the future. Here is just a quick shout out for all uh, our partners that have made this week possible. We thank you all. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. And you are very much part of a kind of rich and diverse family of, of data scientists um, that we like to work with, we want to support. And next slide, please. If you have enjoyed these sessions of this week, do stay in touch with us. You can do that, for example, by joining one of our um, kind of community groups. We have a data ethics club, for example. We also have one around data visualization that meets monthly. You can follow us on, on LinkedIn and Twitter, have a look at our website, um, read our blogs or even submit a blog. It'd be lovely to have your views. You can subscribe to our newsletter. Um, and if um, all these activities have kind of piqued your interest and there's another date that I just want to flag for your diaries. Uh, next slide, please. We, are, we, are, we have confirmed we're going to put on our next showcase, which is a two day event, a celebration of all things data science in the university, city and region. And this is going to be held on the 17th and 18th of February. It was postponed because of the pandemic, but we've now confirmed that the face to face events are going to happen at the M Shed, which is an industrial museum in the heart of Bristol Harbourside. But it'll be a blended event and we will also have some online activities as well. So if you've enjoyed this, put that in your diaries and we'd love to see you. Um, so that's me, and now it gives me huge pleasure to um, welcome our speaker this morning. Um, Rob Challen is an ex-clinician and data scientist in the math department at Exeter University. His research is focused on machine learning and natural language processing of medical records until the panic pandemic intervened, after which he diverted his data wrangling skills to help develop a clearer picture of the outbreak. He's a member of the Joint University's Pandemic and Epidemiological Research Consortium, Juniper, and the Scientific Pandemic Influenza Modeling Group, SPIAM. He contributes data analysis to SPIAM and SAGE to help inform the government's policy decisions. And we're enormously privileged to have him coming to talk to us today. Rob, over to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's great. Um, hi there. So uh, um, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I've put together a talk here, which is Kind of combination of a few pieces of research that we've been doing um, most um, most focused on B16172 the Indian variant uh, and um, this is some of the work that's helped uh, as as um, Kate mentioned helped inform the government's um, policies in the, the recent uh, recent uh, few weeks so um, sort of to for people, I don't quite know what the audience is, but I'm going to going to assume not a huge amount of knowledge about um, the stuff that we're doing. Um, one of the um, key markers that we've been uh, monitoring uh, in in the outbreak is a, a blood test, uh, 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 um, a PCR test result uh, for. Uh, the S gene sequence of SARS-CoV, and this is important because it's a, it's a marker for one of the mutations in in the DNA um, that is present in some of the variants rather than others. So, although uh, the main test is the purpose of the main test is to look for the presence or absence of SARS itself, um, it also gives us a little bit more information about some of the uh, the structures of some of the the genetics in in the in the um, virus itself. And that gives us an ex uh, a bit of information about um, what kind of variant is being, is, is causing the infection. So uh, the S gene uh, test is, is actually part of the Thermo Fisher Tac Pass test, um, which is uh, one of the, which is used in the Lighthouse Labs, um, some, some of the bigger laboratories looking at the community testing. Um, and that test looks for the three genes uh, in SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it looks for the spike gene, the N gene, and the ORF1AB gene. And, and it does this through uh, some sort of um, uh, polymer polymerase chain reaction, which is um, uses primer sequences. Uh, and then the little probes bind to the primer sequences. The primer sequences are then uh, multiplied up. And, um, and then when, when we get to some level of exponential multiplication of primer sequences uh, they're, they're detectable through some sort of light um, just um, through some optical method um, so the ct value is the number of times that uh, that cycling is done 
before we get a positive result. Uh, so a CT value of 30 means that uh, there was 30, 30 amplifications or 30 doublings of the, the sequence within the test itself before something was detected. Um, so within the, through, um, within the test process itself, we, like I said, we're looking for three particular genes um, and there's actually a fourth control gene. But um, the usual positive test result is if the S, uh, the, the, all three genes are detected. So that's called the S positive, N positive, or F positive, uh, triple positive or S gene positive, uh, which is why I just call it S gene positive um, for the rest of the talk. And, and that, that means that all these three targets were found in the patient's sample. Uh, and that um, is compatible with a, a number of different uh, variants. I'll come back to that in just one sec. Um, in the recent past, uh, I'll come to that, um, there have been quite a lot of test results in which we, we got N gene and RF gene, but the S gene wasn't detected. And um, this turned out to be because the Kent variant B117 has a mutation right in the middle of the one of the primer sequences for the S gene and the S primer can't bind as effectively and therefore it, um, that signal uh, is suppressed. So uh, the Kent variant at B117 had N gene and RF gene coming through detected uh, as normal, but we didn't have S gene detection. And these are called S gene negatives. So uh, that, that mutation within the Kent variant um, helped us to, to, fire, to use, uh, to detect the Kent variant. Um, but uh, now, or uh, over the more recent past, um, the S positive test or the S positive test result has, uh, has been uh, allowed us to see things that are not the Kent variant. And the things that are not the Kent variant, these um, uh, different, um, uh, are a mix of different variants. So um, originally the wild types so are the original Wuhan strain and probably the stuff that was circulating over last summer. The South African variant B1351, the Brazilian variants and, and the Indian variants, which are the subjects of the talk. Um, so there are a whole lot of other outcomes to this test being any, any kind of test that there can be issues with it. And generally they, they kind of usually are some sort of resolving infections. I won't really talk about that, but it is, it is a big issue, um, in terms of the analysis. Um, the pillar two labs I mentioned are the only ones that use the TACPATH tester. There isn't any hospital testing using TACPATH. So, um, what that means is that when we're looking at S gene, S gene results, um, we're looking at essentially at community acquired infection, not hospital acquired infection. So I kind of mentioned this, um, that the S gene negative test in the, you know, previously allowed us to, to follow the outbreak of B117. Obviously this S gene dropout we saw in the 5th of November, we started to see just this little, a yellow patch of, of tests where of, in, in Kent where the percentage of, of test results was um, more S gene negative than S gene positive. And it took a little while for us to completely figure out what that, the cause of that was um, and the sequencing eventually, but the sequencing eventually sort of demonstrated that there was this uh, new variant, the Kent variant. And, and really we saw that spread quite rapidly from Kent into the, to the north of England, Bristol, east, east, and um, really within the whole three month period from November to, to 5th of February, um, the country switched from being wild type in blue here to B117 uh, in red. So, you know, sort of towards the end of February, beginning of March, there was pretty much complete uh, dominance of B117. So, um, sorry, these are a little bit small, but it's the concepts I wanted to, to show you. So, um, we do have sequencing results. Um, we do, uh, so a, a, a proportion of the tests that are done um, uh, in both 
pillar one and pillar two are then sent to be to be sequenced. We've, we've got probably the most advanced sequencing um, service in the world, possibly, and um, quite a high proportion of tests get sequenced eventually. Uh, but the eventually is the problem in that um, it does take two or three weeks um, before we get full coverage of the sequencing results. The S gene results are um, available pretty much immediately. Um, so they, um, they're, they're quite a good or quite a useful proxy for what is coming down the track. So we th started looking, you know, within uh, in March and April at the S gene tests. So bear in mind that you know, the whole of the rest of the country is essentially uh, um, S negative because of the B117 variant, but we started to look at S positive cases to see if there was any signal in there. And so what we started doing is comparing the sequencing results, um, which is in this panel here, the S positive voc -VUI. Uh, So these are showing variants of concern uh, that are compatible with S positive. So at that time, it was uh, things like uh, uh, B11318, which no one's ever heard of anymore, uh, the South African variant, the Indian variant, which was only one variant, it's now been split into three, and the Brazilian variant, and the residual wild type from previous summer. So we're looking for that, that bunch of tests, uh, that bunch of variants in this S gene signal. And we're seeing that there were, there were a few a small numbers, six or seven cases in Birmingham, that kind of thing. Um, and on top of that, there were these S positives, which hadn't been sequenced. And we saw a, a, a similar geogra geographical pattern, not identical, but um, similar geographical pattern. Um, and then the sort of wild types, which were the sort of more the dist distractors as, as we thought at the time. And this analysis really showed that um, there, were, there were areas of the country in which we were, there were more um, S positive tests and more sequenced. Uh, and those were Leicester, Nottingham, Bolton, Birmingham, um, Harrow, Hanslow and Newham. So, so there was sort of um, the Midlands, um, the, nor the, the Northwest and, and East and West London. I'm kind of looking at that in much more detail where we sort of um, put the S gene positive counts here uh, over time. I'm sorry, I don't have the time axes on these. They've got chopped off, but the 28th of March to 28th of April is this period. Um, and you see here um, the the sequencing results of the coloured blobs and the uh, the S positives that haven't yet been sequenced are the um, are the grey bars here. So we saw this kind of pattern where uh, there's you know, early signs of exponential growth in, in Leicester. And that, but there was a mix of variants here. So in, in Leicester, there was B1617 discovered, but also quite a lot of wild types. So it was a bit difficult to be sure what, what was driving that exponential growth. In Bolton, there was actually more wild type and B1351 early on in the sequencing results. But this, um, this sort of beginning of, a, of a, a sort of exponential growth process, um, East London was very much more mixed, uh, as was uh, West London, uh, although there's more, more suggestion of the Indian variant there. Um, one of the things we noted early on, is that, or was concern early on, was uh, whether these cases were in fact being imported and just detected by people coming in, sorry, detected when people come in by um, by the, the um, border services and and in Leicester you can see that the, the a lot of the tests were done as a result of some sort of screening process and there were actually very few symptomatic tests early on and and this was felt to be some indication that that uh, certainly in Leicester this was driven by importation. Um, Nottingham on the other hand was almost all symptomatic uh, as was Bolton um, and London the picture less less simple to to be clear um you know some of these some of the when the tests have been sequenced we do get some information about whether or not there, there were travelers in or whether the, the sequences came from travelers so you see you know for the few tests where we do have information um again 
there was sort of some evidence for travel in, in, in London more than, and Leicester more than the others. And one of the most striking facts uh, that make, make us think this is more likely to be imputation, I suppose, was that this was really, you know, mostly in the Asian community at this time, um, particularly in Leicester. Uh, and um, but but you know really everywhere. Okay, so that was sort of back in April. So what we see uh, here is this is now up to up to the current time, and and I suppose that that period that we we're just looking at was kind of at the bottom of this blue curve, and the blue curve is the number, the solid blue curve is the number of positive S gene positive tests. Uh, this on a log scale so uh, and the the red curve is the number of s negative tests so the s negative tests compatible with b117 the s positive tests compatible with a range of different virus uh, different variants but including the indian variant and what we said so what we saw is about that time that we're looking at, at on the previous slide is this kind of inflection and cases um the S positive cases started to rise again. I mean, from very small numbers, this is 20 cases in the UK, uh, sorry, in England. Um, the other lines on this, the dashed lines are the number of sequenced results that we've got. So you can see that the, they're actually sequencing now almost all of, all of the cases. Well, it's actually about half because of the log scale, but um, we're sequencing almost all of the cases, a large proportion of the cases, let's say, of both S positives and S negatives. And you can see uh, towards the end of the time series, not particularly clearly that the sequencing activity falls away uh, and that's just a delay in reporting. So what did this sequencing show us? Well, um, this is uh, the different, this is the breakdown of the different variants. So this, uh, this the main line here decreasing is um, is what was called uh, non variants of concern or, or variants under investigation. These are the wild type uh, variants, so the things that were circulating last summer. And then uh, we see also the South African variant. We see that's been fairly stable over time as a proportion of the uh, as a sorry count of the number of um, of um, S positive tests and as has the Brazilian variant, the green line there. But the, the, the thing that's obviously standing out is the is the exponential growth here of um, of the Indian variants. So this is B16172. There, the, there are actually the, the other variant, it's has sort of dropped away. So as a proportion, that's obviously now showing that the um, as a of the S positive cases. Uh, you know, a hundred, almost one hundred percent of them are now B one six one seven two. So we've gone from this position where vast majority of these S positive cases were wild type to the vast to the vast majority of these being Indian variant over the period from January uh, till now, and that sort of transition time probably I don't know um, would would guess about uh, mid April. Okay. Um, so going back to this question of um, importation um, and one of the, the, the sort of questions really about, about um, untangling the picture as, as to whether or not this, this represented local growth and, um, or, or whether it was just cases coming in that we were handling with testing, tracing and people were isolating and, and, and then um, we didn't need to worry about it too much. So uh, what we looked at um, to try and understand that is the age distribution of the cases. Um, now, if um, if the, uh, so then this is a comparative measure, so looking at the age distribution of S gene positive cases and the, and the age distribution of S gene negative cases. Uh, so what we have, the S gene negative cases, Kent variant would be, um, representative of community transmission and the S gene positive cases, uh, the age distribution would be representative, if it's different, uh, might be representative that of importation into specific age groups, like travelers, for example. Um, so what we've got here is a, a 
a similarity metric, the Wasserstein distance, also known as the Earth Movers distance, uh, between those two distributions, the distribution of ages of the uh, SG positive, the distribution of ages of the SG negative. And on these plots, um, where, uh, where there are grey bars um, on these plots are times when the distributions between those two things are different. Um, the, the larger regional um, areas, I just skip over for the moment and just look at focus on Bolton. Um, and what we see in Bolton is that the age distributions of S gene positive and S gene negative cases are the, are the same. Uh, so that's uh, the black line overlaying the purple confidence intervals, uh, apart from one one period when um, you know around mid April. Yeah, mid April. Um, and similarly in the uh, M65 corridor, which is Blackburn, Preston, I think, um, the difference, uh, there's, a, there's one, one sort of period where, where the age distributions start to diverge significantly. Uh, and then they kind of, both of those two places, they've returned to normality um, or, or return to the same age distribution in the more recent past. You can see the same pattern in Leicester there. Um, you know, there was this period where there was probably importation, maybe a little bit earlier. And in, in Nottingham, the age distribution is still, well, it has remained different uh, to a certain extent. This isn't going to be a perfect comparison because, um, you know, school outbreaks, large school outbreaks, for example, will, will influence this, but uh, it does give us some, um, some some idea uh, of uh, of differences, and and you can see that with the the um, with this area in Nottingham, what seems to have happened is actually the S gene positive cases have got older for a little while, uh, and then younger, and then came back to some sort of normality. But actually, the age distributions of the um, negatives got older and then got very much younger and that was associated with the S negative uh, B117 outbreak amongst schools. So this was really evidence um, that, that, uh, that the in the more recent times that the, um, the outbreaks were driven by community transmission. So moving on kind of to now, um, so now start focusing just specifically on the sequencing results of B117 and B6172. Uh, these are all on slightly different scales, but you can see uh, that these areas that were were um, high originally, so Bolton, Birmingham, Blackburn, um, also now kind of Leeds, Manchester, uh, they're all kind of um, higher now um, for uh, B1672, so that these are over about a month period, and we're seeing, you know, in the high hundreds cases over for that four week period uh, in these areas. Um, there are yet more unsequenced S positives on top of those in, in these in these particular areas, which, you know, really make us th um, think that there is an additional problem in Birmingham beyond that, which we're seeing in the sequencing results. And the B117 cases we see are slightly differently distributed, more slightly to this um, uh, northeast um, side uh, of the north, um, and also now uh, much, much lower in terms of numbers. Um, and this is changing rapidly over, over time. Um, and continues to do so as, as B1617 takes over. Uh, that um, UK picture is, is um, of, of different geograph geographical distributions is, is also present locally. And then for, I'm not going to go through all of these places, but for example, in London, we see there's a lot of B16172 cases in Croydon and the areas around that, although um, th there is there are there are plenty um, in the rest of, of London. Um, and maybe that is slightly different geographically. You know, the B1617, sorry, the B117 chem variant distribution is is much less uh, much less focal 
and and uh, more uniform, which you kind of expect with a a resolving a resolving um, outbreak, a uh, countrywide outbreak. Whereas this, I suppose, is much more consistent with the idea of specific pockets of 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 specific locations starting to have outbreaks. Um, right. So yeah. So going looking kind of. At the picture now, in terms of these histograms um, or these epidemic curves, what we see, particularly in the northwest, is this continued exponential growth. And I think these pictures also sort of highlight some of the issues that we have dealing with this kind of data, in that there's a strong, strong weekday effects, um, which uh, make quite difficult or make it comparatively difficult to to understand what the the uh, exponential growth pattern actually is uh, and there's also these drop-offs towards the end of the time series as we have delays in 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 getting results both of sequencing results which are the um, the gray ones here the ones that we don't have sequencing results here for but also of those tests themselves of the positive uh, tests so the last four days are, are fairly unreliable and, and could be just a the continued pattern of exponential growth. So usually, when we're looking at this kind of data, we kind of take the last take off the last four days, uh, of which you know, it covers the, the sort of ninety seven percent of the delays. So anyway, we can see that the northwest is is now still growing um, exponentially, and that uh, that all the sequencing now is coming of the S gene positives is coming back as B one six one seven two. Uh, and that, you know, the vast majority of that is the result of screening, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, is a result of symptoms. Um, well, we see now that um, in terms of the um, ethnicity distribution, that um, this is now much more mixed uh, and uh, much more representative of the population as a whole. I'll kind of come back to this bit, but the ages of these people are um you know there's there's quite a, a few young people this isn't normalized by population size but there's quite a few school age people the 22 to 44 age group is big anyway but um but it's overrepresented here uh, so yes we see the northwest is is continuing uh, to grow quickly midlands and the london are are um growing a little bit less quickly. Uh, looking just at that, breaking down that northwest region, you can see that Bolton, where we first had um, concerns, doesn't really do it justice because of the scales are the same here, but that exponential growth period um, continued really until uh, um, middle of May when um, Screen, extra screening was put in place and, and has but has stabilized with that extra screening um so uh, growth has been so um, with, the, with the additional package of support measures put into place in bolton um th that growth has tailed off uh, and it's now fairly flat but in the other areas like blackburn um we're still seeing exponential growth and manchester has, has recently um really taken off uh, which is a huge concern given this highly connected nature of these areas. Um, I think just this picture just reiterates the, the kind of heterogeneous um, ethnicity and, and, the, and the focus on younger age groups. Uh, in the Midlands, we've got very similar patterns. Nottingham kind of grumbled along for ages without huge amounts of um, concern and has now started to grow. Leicester grew steadily but um, hasn't really taken off yet but Birmingham is, is now uh, in, in epidemic phase. Um, I will skip over that. Um, I sort of focused on, in, I never know where to put this slide in really, uh, I focused on three areas really um in 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 that last bit of analysis which is just the northwest the midlands and a little bit on london and i kind of conveniently ignored the other regions and the reason for that is partly to do with the fact that they the, the um 
the focus of of um, the outbreaks at the moment, uh, the pillar two positives coming coming in here, are in in the northwest, the Midlands, and London, and less in the in the northeast and the southwest. Uh, it's also partly to do with the fact that the labs in the different areas um, use different test uh, types. So in the southwest, there are um, they don't really use the tack path. Thermofish tack path test. So we don't have this S gene information in the southwest almost at all. Uh, and in the northeast, although it doesn't look too bad here in terms of the coverage of the testings, they they haven't yet figured out how to automatically upload the test results. So we get some test results uh, on a kind of bi-weekly basis, and and the the additional delay in that causes quite a lot of confusion trying to, to pick these things out. So we kind of focused on these three regions, Northwest Midlands and London. London's coverage actually isn't that great either, but it's important to, to look at, I guess, um, for practical purposes. But what that means is that, you know, this analysis is focusing on growth and, and outbreaks and, and the lack of information in the Southwest just means that we could have major problems. Um, okay, so what we're what we're kind of interested in, or what we're interested in, is how how um, what the impact of this was uh, in terms of uh, the how how much faster uh, B one six one seven two was growing than um, than the Kent variant, and um, so this this graph is uh, is our first efforts at that. Um, so th what this shows is the um, the growth rate, the exponential growth rate of um, the S gene negatives and the S gene positives. Um, so uh, the S gene negatives, so this is so representing the Kemp variant, um, have been steadily under, under zero, so steadily declining. Uh, and there's a doubling time down here of minus 14 days. So it's halving the size of the, of the S, um, S negative uh, epidemic has been consistently decreasing, halving every 14 days since since February. And we've seen that in the case numbers. Um, back in February, uh, even faster uh, decline was seen in the S positive cases. And I sort of remind you that back in February, the S positive cases really represented the wild type um, or the variants we had over the summer last year, which were less transmissible than B117. And, and you can see that that uh, the, the difference between these two lines represents that difference in transmissibility from B117 to, to the wild type. Uh, we said around sort of end of March, beginning of April, uh, that uh, the S gene, we saw that um, S gene curve turn over and start to grow and that's um that's this point here and that's when when the composition of that um s gene positive switched over or began to switch over from wild type to um b16172 and as as we've uh, got into the recent past we saw that the s gene the composition of the s gene positive is now almost 100 percent b16172 and uh that is doubling uh, uh, every well 10 days approximately at the moment um there's various different methods of uh, estimating the growth rate we've got here and some of them uh, i don't have the full time series for because they're done by different people and i haven't given them the data to update it on since we last did it um and but i i, I kind of left them in because uh, it shows one of the interesting effects or difficulties that we have doing this, which is this tail effect. So the um, the last few points of the growth rate, which for these estimates was was here uh, in um, uh, about the twenty third of of April, uh, can drive some of these can drive some of these. Um, estimates the tail of some of these estimates quite significantly and cause cause oscillations um which are quite difficult to deal with and, and, and especially when you're finding that some of those data points are, are, are quite low quality um it makes it quite hard to make these estimates okay so that's the countrywide picture uh which is the kind of um I don't know what the highest level of aggregation if we look at this at slightly lower levels of aggregation 
we see that growth advantage in the northwest is maybe a little bit bigger uh, and certainly the transition between uh, wild type and b16172 was quite abrupt uh, and the estimates struggle a little bit to fit to that transition as they're all kind of expecting it to be relatively smooth. Uh, in the Midlands, we saw that, you know, the transition was uh, uh, slower. And I think that's that's really representing that the S gene um, signal in this in this slower transition is it was more of a mix of different variants, it was more of a mix of wild type and B16172 and the, all the other different possible variants and and more and more so in London I think this this slower slower earlier increase represents the um, the kind of combined effect of importation and importation of different variants I think that pattern is uh, repeated on the even finer grain uh, geographic analysis um, but again with with more rapid transitions but what I just pick out on the Bolton curves is that you know the effect of of putting in the um, the interventions has been to kind of bring bring the growth rate um, of of six one seven two down delta variant down and and it's now kind of roughly zero so it's roughly stable um, but we're still seeing that there's a difference between uh, those cases and um, and the the few residual cases that are the Kent variant. So even though this package of measures has brought growth of, of the Indian variant under control, it has also um, brought, it has pushed down growth of, of the Kent variant more than it's pushed down um, growth of the Indian variant. So there still remains a difference despite the fact that you know, all these measures have been put in place. And, you know, in Manchester, I think we saw in that case curve is currently doubling every six days. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'll skip over that. Um, so I, I always say that. So just looking at this um, growth rate, if we have a, this, the, these growth rates uh, for the Kent variant about minus 0.5, a um, little bit more actually, but say with minus 0.5 if we assume that um the growth rate of of um one variant is minus 0.5 uh then we can calculate transmission advantages um based on uh the growth rate we observe of the second strain so this is uh, this is it for any combination of growth rates um and the transmission advantages of the lines across here but um, looking focusing just at the example of the growth rate of the s negative zero minus 0 0.05 which is roughly what we're observing at the moment then um, a growth rate of 0.1 is looking at a transmission advantage of of uh, 2.5 so that's 150 percent now although um, that is rough yeah, so it's a little bit less than that in Leicester. So we're saying maybe 0.5. So uh, the transmission advantage here would be, um, you know, approximately, um, say, let's say, uh, 80% at that point, or 1.8, uh, 80% transmission advantage. Um, so uh, this has big implications uh, for um, control, uh, obviously. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, 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 and, and the, the sort of modeling, which demonstrates what kind of effects that we can see, um, has been done by other members of some of the Juniper group and, and, and those, those models have, have driven some of the decision-making over the recent few days. Uh, I just kind of point out though, that this growth advantage and transmission advantage are quite different things. Uh, so if, if the growth advantage um, is how quickly it, we observe it to be growing. The transmission advantage is, is actually some sort of biological property of the virus itself. Um, and, but because outbreaks are occurring only in populations with susceptibility, um, uh, th those, those, I mean, th th those populations are sort of select or self-selecting for outbreaks uh, because they mix in particular ways or they, they've 
not had so much vaccine or they may maybe some specific genetics that mean they're more susceptible to a particular strain so outbreaks will kind of occur in in those in those communities um and uh there's there can be quite um quite a different there's no control group uh, between between um those communities where an outbreak will happen um for one strain versus the other because the strain sort of selects uh, that control that group that it will that it will uh increase in so so when we're comparing s gene positive s gene negative cases you know they they are in different populations and they have different different mixing habits um and these these kind of fast growth uh patterns can be caused because the virus gets into a particular a particular po population which is socializing more for example or into a specific school or university and, and grows suddenly rapidly i mean the other problems in in making these comparisons that we saw with bolton that the case finding activity um affects the growth rate which is what we wanted to do but it does make it harder to to judge the relative the relative effects um and then uh, I mentioned the time series issues. So kind of overall, the state of the uh, epidemic now, very quick, so we've got time for some questions. We're seeing now uh, growth in all areas in case numbers. So these are symptomatic cases and um, you know, just case numbers in all, all NHS regions going up. Um, the actually quickest in the southwest was growing quickest in the southwest so the growth is on the x-axis here uh, but the highest numbers in the, the northwest um, re re reflecting their, their early um, v one six one seven twos early spread in, in the northwest but everywhere is is following the same pattern um, and by age group, you can see if you split out the age groups that the um, slightly younger age groups, the bluer uh, ones, are the ones that um, are case numbers are growing fastest in, um, which may be not hugely surprising given what we know about partly vaccination, but partly mixing habits and uh, release from lockdown and all those things. Uh, and again, we saw that. And again, we saw that age distribution, you sort of see these younger age groups. So this is as a proportion of overall cases. Um, we see these uh, 15 to 24 uh, age bands starting to increase in size as the older age groups get squashed a bit. That may be um, a vaccination effect uh, or may, uh, could also uh, could easily be explained by um, people socializing more as well um very quickly we've got admissions beginning to show the same patterns so um admissions in the northwest are growing less quickly than, than cases but uh, clearly growing and that's the true of all all regions although growth in in the other regions is is quite slow at the moment um and it's come from a very low baseline um the pattern in deaths is is um it's less clear uh, although I think um, there's good good signs that the northwest or good uh, evidence the northwest is starting to starting to grow again in terms of deaths these will be very lagged in the Midlands possibly as well these will be very lagged compared to the cases okay so that's uh, that's the end of the, the the talk I hope hope that was um, easy to follow uh, I think you know the the key takeaways from it for me were just to sort of emphasize that this s gene positive signal was a little bit hard to interpret to beginning to begin with um, um partly because of this mixture of different it representing a mixture of different variants and um the the role of case importation but we've kind of uh gone past that now uh, it's now kind of the genomics is really telling us very clearly that all the all the growth now in s positive cases is 6172 um you know although we saw this growth um in in the the split 
between S positive and S negative cases in the in the overall case numbers, um, that growth was masked and it's been difficult, I suppose, to persuade people sometimes that there's a major issue going on when case numbers are going down overall. Um, but now that has sort of been unmasked because B117 is now in the minority and, and B1672 is dominant strain, uh, we're really seeing that growth, um, particularly in, in the younger age groups. And we're probably seeing that reflects in hospital emissions and deaths. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, so just a quick word of thanks to uh, the many people who, um, who've participated and contributed to this, this work. Um, and the, um, are my funders there. Okay. Um, I think that's me. So yeah. Thank you, Rob. Um, that was really interesting. Um, we do have a few questions, so I'll I can just um, let you know which the most upvoted ones were on the Slido. Um, so there's one here that says, "Why do you think that most of the new strains uh, come to the UK more rapidly than to other countries?" Well, I'm I'm not sure uh, that I mean obviously Kent variant got here first because it it, 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 it it sort of um, was created here. I think in terms of the uh, Delta variant, um, there are obviously close travel links between the UK and India, and that's been, um, that's driven quite a lot of the, um, the seeding of, of the outbreak here. I, I was kind of looking at other variants around the world um, this morning and and that this pattern is being is being replicated elsewhere Germany has got quite a lot of cases now um, you know one of the reasons we are so good at uh, um, picking it up is just this this the amount of sequencing we do um, but there are also outbreaks of other variants things that we just haven't heard of here in in places like the US um, there's an iota variant in the US, which seems to be quite prevalent in a number of states. So I think it, it, it's possibly just our, our focus on these specific variants in the UK and the UK news, which maybe gives us a slightly biased biased view of what's going on globally. But 6172 is clearly more trend, more uh, has an advantage over, over the other strains. So it, it will spread, I think. Cool. Yeah, that's a great answer. I didn't know about the IOTA variant. So who did? Really <laughs> um, so we've got a few um, more uh, questions here. So one of them, this is my question. So I'll be, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'm going to ask it. Um, is that I just, I noticed you have like loads of really nice R graphs um, and you, and, um, and it seems like data visualization probably like plays quite a big role in your research and like seeing what's going on. So I just wondered if you could like talk a little bit about about that. Yeah, I mean, I think within SPYM, which is essentially a modeling group, um, I'm a little bit of an anomaly in that my my main focus is just looking at the data and trying to trying to um, demonstrate the the uh, patterns in the data as clearly as I can. There is quite a lot of data and it's linked um, in various ways. There are a lot of data quality issues um, with it. But, um, you know, I think because there's quite a lot of different data, getting the right um, facets in that data to show what you want to show people is is part of the um, part of the problem. So, one of the things I've found, for example, is that um, excluding the screening tests from from the data sets gives you a clearer picture of of, of community growth, um, but it does give you it tends to give you a higher answer and things like that. So yeah, um, all mostly in R. A lot of it is simply just taking the data, making it into proportions or fitting some very basic curves to it and, and getting it out onto onto uh, and visualizing it in, in ways that kind of make sense to people. 
Cool. Um, okay, so I think we maybe have time for one or two more questions. So there's a new uh, one that came into the chat here. That's, do you think the new variants will be able to evade the immune responses evoked by the vaccines? And and is that something that you could predict with your models? Uh, personally, I don't think um, I could demonstrate that. Um, there is a lot of work going on in that area. Um, uh, there is, um, so there was kind of clear evidence a while back that um, the South African variant was evading the immune response to some vaccines more than others. Um, it, I think there is emerging evidence that, um, that the Delta variant also has a, an advantage in that respect. Um, it's not clear to me how significant that is. Um, and it's not clear to me whether that's across all age groups. There are a lot of different factors at play in that question. One is, have you had both vaccine doses? The other is, uh, how old are you? Uh, and how long ago was the vaccine given? Which vaccine it was? And the, most of the efforts to, to kind of resolve that at the moment um, have been slightly underpowered. Uh, they are finding small differences. Um, for the for the Indian variant, though, over over the um, so so more vaccine escape than than um, than the Kent variant, um, but whether or not that is like it's like clinically significant remains to be seen. I think 